Indeed, Kraftwerk promoted the album with a tour not of rock clubs, but of universities, parties and art galleries. A modest success and released only domestically, it nevertheless introduced the band to new listeners and placed them on the musical map. During the first half of 1971, however, the band underwent many dramatic changes. Ralph Hutter unexpectedly quit, leaving Florian Schneider to lead a perpetually changing ensemble. Eventually, guitarist Michael Rother joined the band, with Klaus Dinger the lone drummer. Although this lineup did record several tracks with Connie Plank and made a TV appearance, it was not to last. Yet the German scene itself was proving that it did have staying power, with Ashra Temple's groundbreaking self-titled debut unleashed in June, and both Cluster and Popol Vuh's second albums faring well with the critics, and ensuring that they kept their small but secure audiences. We were pretty much aware that we weren't raised in the Mississippi Delta, or we weren't raised in Liverpool, and it was certainly not our identity. And having an artistic mind somehow, probably I didn't know at that time, um, I think our generation had to come up with a counterpoint to that. It wouldn't, it, it, it doesn't make sense really to uh, play the mu music you really love, you really like, uh, it's one thing, but coming up with an own genuine idea and uh, by def defining your, all, your own uh, reality and your own culture, you have to come up with some other thing. Es wird gerne gesagt, naja, äh, äh, die Entstehung von Krautrock hätte was damit zu tun, dass die Bands hier in Deutschland äh, sich gesagt hätten, Ja, also Rock'n'Roll als äh, typisch amerikanische Musik können wir gar nicht so gut spielen. Also es ist nicht so, dass man sagte, okay, wir können kein Rock'n'Roll spielen, also erfinden wir etwas anders. Also so, als hätte es da eine Diskussion gegeben und einen Plan. Es ergab sich von, von selber. And suddenly you, you had the feeling so many musicians, so many bands, so many uh, influences, so uh, uh, this just can happen once, I think, yeah. It, it was the Blütezeit, the blooming, yeah, of, of German music uh, at its peak. By September 1971, work began on Kraftwerk's second album. Michael Rother and Klaus Dinger had by now departed to form Neu, who would become one of the most influential bands on the German scene, and Hutter and Schneider were now reduced to a duo. Having begun work on the construction of a personal studio the previous year, the pair recorded their fresh compositions both at this newly built location in Dusseldorf and at Connie Planck's studio in Hamburg. The result of their labours was the album Kraftwerk II. I think with each subsequent Kraftwerk album, they... Uh stripping back something is a little bit more and more but of course it's still with the stage of crap work too. they are still using um what you might call conventional instruments but using them as if almost as if they were electronic instruments in some ways and they are experimenting with laying down different configurations different patterns working with kind of repetitions almost using the instrument as a thing in itself you know exploring textures as it were rather than text you know still reluctant to introduce vocals and so it is, you know, looking back at the time, I mean, they, they, they've disavowed uh, those albums of crap work. They don't really want people to hear them. They'd rather that the year zero of the crap work occurred a little bit further down the line in the mid-70s somewhere. But you can, you know, these albums are actually eminently listenable as things in their own right. And you can see the direction they're heading in. 
to be honest, a lot of the tracks on Craftworks 1 and 2 are basically experiments. There's, there, there, there's not many uh, on those albums which are um, that melodic, with the exception of, say, Kling Clang on the second record, which is a, the defining moment in, in, in Craftworks, where they actually they, they come up with this glacial motoric, so a motoric beat and then the glacial keyboards and flutes over the top, which is, is their, uh, their, their, their trademark. And this is what happened on Kling Clang. I think they probably came upon that. And this would be the sound that would define them, because obviously they couldn't keep on just doing experiments. First of all, that uh, the synthesizers, it synthesizes sound, you know, forming the basis of the sound. They're directing it, they're leading it, they're shaping it, and I mean, there are no vocals. Um, you've got instruments like flute just playing a kind of very supplementary role, kind of filling in, adding colour here and there. And in fact, they would use electronics to create that kind of effect later on. Um, they've got these wonderful little very speed effects um, going on as well. And in a sense, with that element, particularly that track, they are kind of setting, setting the tone um, for what they're going to do the rest of their career, that kind of futuristic yet serene, you know, as the equivalent of um, the painter like Fernand Leger with these kind of friendly robots handing out flowers that, um, you know, the future new technology need not be something that mankind would be at odds with. Um, but the rest of the album doesn't really tie in with that. The rest of the album is more kind of... You know, it, it's, it's, it's more kind of fragments of experimentation and ideas that they would eventually um, you know, dispense with. There's a precision about Kraftwerk, which is not really... It, it, their music is more about concision, right? where the other albums, where you get these double and double Amondul and double Astra Temple albums, just all... I mean, you could pick up... You used to, I used to pick up the needle in the record shop I worked in in Dublin, I used to put it down anywhere, and it would be just like... <laughs> And we just wouldn't have to then flip it over and put it in the middle of the track, and it'd be just a load of stuff. I forget it. But with Crawford, you wanted to listen to each track because it had some kind of structure, where there wasn't any structure on the early Amon do <laughs> Astro Temple albums. My favorite Kraftwerk track of all times is this piece called Strom, um, where they were just demonstrating the electric guitar, um, an instrument that was not very important for them, but. <laughs> So, I mean, th that was already so obvious how they, that they had a completely different attitude towards um, um, instruments. The instruments were not instruments in the sense of, of instrumental for, uh, for production of something that has been conceived elsewhere, but uh, they had a life of their own. You, know? you put on an electric guitar, let's see what it does. Obviously, the, the aesthetic investment was into something completely different from what all the other bands were into. All the other bands were into, was, a, was the most different means, but they were all into experience. Every, everything was about having an experience with music. And Kraftwerk was not that. It was obviously about distance to, to music. It was, there was something conceptual, there was something humorous, there was irony. But at the other, on the other hand, it was not comedy. It was not, it was not openly ironic. It was not was not the Bonzo Dog Luda band or something like that. So it was, uh, th that was, uh, even for me as a 13 year old, clearly different from anything else. Yet during 1972, the scene continued to diversify. Bands such as Can, who followed up the landmark Tego Mago with the equally successful Ig Bamyazi, persevered in their exploration of the extreme possibilities of rock music while the electronic field continued to evolve. Edgar Froese's Tangerine Dream had released the albums Alpha Centauri and Zeit, in which the band had progressed from the experimental psychedelia of electronic meditation into an atmospheric sound that Froese himself termed cosmic music. And former member Klaus Schulze, who had also been testing the boundaries of psychedelic rock with Ashra Temple, emerged as a prominent electronic musician in his own right with his debut solo record, Ehrlicht. I want to do at this time 100% electronic music, not the compromise with a, uh, with a bit 
with, uh, let's say, conventional instruments creating new sounds. I said, why don't you, we start with a synthesizer and make a new sound instead of uh, playing a guitar backwards or whatever uh, and sing. But they, they were still, so uh, they still want to have it in, as an important part of this music. They want to have traditional drums and traditional guitar. Okay, they have some, they give, uh, let's say, in one hour, they give you five minutes to just freak out with this. But then we have to come back to this. And this, I was really fed up. And I said, no, I, I do it alone. Because at this time, I was parallel also doing, also doing tangerine time. Uh, I was doing at home, experimenting with it. it with a tape recorder, a little bit like music concrete tune, uh, but because at this time we had no synthesizer because they came quite late to Europe and also they were incredible, expensive at this time. Uh, today you can have a studio for that, you know. I didn't even know where I'm going alone. And I, but uh, like in the beginning with electronic meditation or with third, first ashra, if it would not work, I would probably be a painter or... A, teacher or whatever, but uh, it worked uh, relative, uh, relatively fast because uh, when, when I released early, it was, uh, I think half a year later, it was kind of a, a top 10 album in, in France. Klaus Schulzer is an interesting case, and Elit is a game album which not only connects with some of the sort of like minimalist things going on in people like in some ways Phil Niblock to a certain extent, although it's much more accessible than his his work, and to the kind of more sort of drone-based experimental electronica of the 21st century. Um, so yes, he peels away from Tangerine Dream, as it were, and um, he does establish this kind of very individual furrow. Klaus Schulz's airlift is a sort of uh, precursor to drone music. It sort of straddles uh, what Sun Ra was doing and say what the um, drone rock bands like uh, Sun and people like that are doing in the, in the 90s and onwards. But it has a very cosmic feel to it, but a very dark edge cosmic feel. You're on the dark side of the moon, if you know what I mean. In the, you're, in, you're in dark space. It's, it's pretty bleak out there. Illich is also a kind of early minimalism as well. It's, it's, it's stripping everything down to the bare essentials of, of what, the, what the entire kraut rock movement was, and particularly what Tangerine Dream were doing and what Ashraf Temple were doing, down to the very minimum. I think he's sort of honed it right down so that you're hearing the very essence of what he was trying to do within those two groups. He was this uh, Einzelgänger, this solo yeah, person. Uh, not really introvert like Florian Fricke, uh, much more open-minded, but I think he was a person who had to do everything under control. There was a part of uh, uh, journalists and media who took him very serious from on the beginning. It was mostly from the classical department. The class classical uh, departments in radio and media um, found this is new classic. And I, I think they are right. He still is. I know myself that it's a very simple, structured album, early, but uh, it is a, a groundbreaking album in, 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 uh, in terms of aesthetic, you know, not from a playing and uh, all this, but uh, just, uh, and this has an importance. And then I said, oh yeah, it worked, and then I made one record after another. Hundreds, nearly hundreds till now.